What is big data? Well, if you turn on your favorite cable news network, they'll tell you that big data is going to stop the rising of the oceans. It's going to end world hunger. We're going to have peace in our time. You're finally going to have a happy marriage. Your dog's going to like you more. And maybe with big data and a tiny little bit of luck, your kids are going to get into a good community college. Or five minutes later on that same network, big data is going to take away our privacy and kill us all. In reality, this is all overblown hype. I consider big data to be the means by which we can answer questions we previously haven't even been able to ask, let alone answer. Since society has managed to survive from the dawn of time until now without big data, let's begin by differentiating between the questions we need big data to answer and the questions we don't need big data to answer. Let's start with the easier one. What type of questions can we answer without big data? Well, let's say in our particular company, our VP of marketing is looking out towards sales for the rest of the year and notices the leads look like they're dropping, especially around the middle of the year. Well, that VP of marketing can look in the database and say, in the past, when we've done a mid-year promotion, what has it done to sales? How many new leads have come in? And we look back, and some years we didn't do one, but in the years we have, we've gotten an average of about 20% lift. This sounds like a great idea. So the VP of marketing walks over next door to sales and knocks on her door and she opens it and she says, hey, why are you here? And the VP of marketing says, I think we should plan a meteor promotion. I think it's gonna give us a 20% increase in sales. The VP of sales says, no, a 20% increase in leads doesn't necessarily mean a 20% increase in sales. So let me look in the past at my database and when you've done those mid-year promotions, how many of those have I been able to close? VP of sales actually gets really inspired and says, wow, my department's pretty awesome. We normally close 10% more sales deals when we have 20% more sales leads. So at this point, the VP of marketing and the VP of sales are very happy with themselves. And they think, wow, as long as we can produce this, we are going to make millions and definitely not have to update our resume. So arm in arm, they walk over to the manufacturing floor where the manufacturing director hangs out. And they say, hey, if we got 10% more in sales, could you handle the increased production? Manufacturing director looks at the production schedule and says, yeah, I think so. Looks like our machines are only at 85% of capacity schedule for the summer. We can easily handle another 10% additional production. So the VP of sales, the VP of marketing, the manufacturing director lock arms, go over to the logistics director. They try and find his office only to find out that the logistics director is actually in a cubicle. So they skip over, knock on the wall of the cubicle. Logistics director looks up and they say, if we increase manufacturing 10% this summer, could you actually ship it out? The logistics director looks in the supply chain database and says, well, based on the schedule, looks like we have space on the trucks, we have space on the trains, we have space on the planes. We can definitely handle another 10% more in sales and get it distributed in time. So at this point, the four of them, maybe they're giving each other piggyback rides, wander over to the accounting department to go find the controller and they say, hey, we got this great idea. We're gonna do a mid-year promotion. We're gonna sell 10% more than we normally would. We can handle the production, can we, ha we can handle the distribution. Do you actually have enough money to fund this though? So the controller pulls up Hyperion, maybe looks inside of Hyperion Financial Management, goes and verifies some ad hoc analysis in an S-based cube and says, yep, based on our current amount of cash, based on the expected spend coming out of Hyperion planning, we can definitely handle this increased 10% in sales. So now we actually do the initiative. Well, VP of marketing doesn't get the 20% lift they expected. It seems like people were making fun of the new product name. So we only get about 15% new leads coming in. VP of sales has a hard time closing them because it looks like most of the customers want a different size product than we're offering, but we still close about 8% more in sales than we expected. Manufacturing director, puts all the extra production on, but notices the machines start jamming. Basically, there are gears that grind against each other, the machines run out of oil, things come to a crashing halt. He manages to get it all to the logistics director at the last possible minute. The logistics director says, no problem at all, since it's only 8% more in production, I can totally get this there on time, but it doesn't arrive on time. 
So when we actually go to look at how much it increased profitability, we don't get an 8% increase in profit. That financial analyst goes back and does some ad hoc analysis in that S-Base cube and finds out profit actually only went up about 2.5%. So at this point, let's say in this company, I get to be CEO. So as CEO, I'm gonna go look in my shareholder database to say, well, what is my historical stock price? And what is it now after this initiative? And did we actually increase stock price? Do our initiatives, this mid-year promotion, all the things related to it, did they actually increase shareholder value? Well, every one of these questions can be answered without big data. So the real question is, what would big data actually help with? Well, that VP of marketing wants to find out what people were saying about the product. We could actually go out now and there's a Twitter tool that lets you put in a product name or any name like love or Congress. It'll come back and give you a score telling you how popular that name actually is, what people are saying about it on Twitter. VP of sales could go out and look at Instagram or Pinterest or Tumblr or what people are saying on Facebook or Twitter. And we can understand, are they liking our mix of products? Are they looking for something else they're not getting? The manufacturing director wants to analyze all those logs of why the machines crash. And they actually fill it all out on a piece of paper and say, oh, ran out of oil, gears ground together. They take all that information and they put it in a binder and they lock it up somewhere. We could actually analyze that text with big data. We'd actually do unstructured data discovery and we can find out, oh, well, the machines were grinding to a halt because normally we do preventative maintenance during the summer. That's why production was at 85%. Logistics director wanted to find out why the shipments kept arriving late. So they sent out a web-based survey. A bunch of people responded in comments as to why things were arriving late. We can analyze all those text comments using big data. Well, we still should have gotten something close to a 5 to 6% increase in profitability. Why didn't we? The controller thinks there must be fraud going on somewhere, but doesn't know where. So we can aim big data at kind of data mining. We could have it look through all the financial information to go find patterns that don't make any sense. And maybe while all this was happening, our computers were crashing, people were sending messages to the help desk email address thinking that would get them a response. We weren't analyzing those emails. We were eventually getting back and telling people we'll fix your email and computer when we have time. But why do our computers crash all the time? Well, that information is there if we could only analyze all those emails. And big data can look through and analyze all that text and all those patterns and find out, oh, well, maybe this particular model crashes during the summer because they overheat. And then there's one really, really important question big, big data needs to answer. Am I going to get fired? Now, this is not stored in a database anywhere. I can't say select star from employment database where termination status equals true. But I can use big data to go out and look at Twitter and say, what are people saying about me and my company? One of the things I love about big data is it's able to answer questions we not only know the answers to, but questions we don't know the answer to. They've been surveying for a number of years, what is the favorite flavor of pie in America? And the answer comes back every single time, it's definitely apple pie. But now with big data, we can actually do some analysis. So somebody went out and said, well, let me look at what people are saying on Twitter, what they say they're buying on Pinterest. Maybe they're posting a Facebook status. Hey, just went to 7-Eleven and picked up this kind of pie, and we can see what pies show up the most often. So somebody did this analysis, spent hundreds and hundreds of hours mining through all this data from all these different sources, and was actually shocked to discover that the number one flavor in America is actually apple pie. Well, this is a case of answering a question you already knew the answer to. He was not terribly shocked that this was the answer, but said, well, let me investigate a little bit deeper. Because what they noticed is that there are actually kind of two major sizes of pie being sold right now in the United States. There's a great big 30 centimeter pie around 12 inches across. And then there's a pie that's about one third that width. And they said, well, could we look at what people are saying on Twitter or Facebook or gathering big data from all the various retailers that are out there? And is Apple the number one flavor in the smaller pies as well? They actually discovered that in the smaller pies, Apple is like fifth. The, it's beaten by cherry pie, pumpkin pie, pecan pie, several other pie flavors, and it comes in roughly at fifth place. Now, this begs an interesting question. 
Does apple somehow taste different in small little four inch 10 centimeter pies versus the bigger 12 inch 30 centimeter pies? Well, of course not. The pies all taste the same. So why are people buying apple in the big pies and apple comes in at fifth in the smaller pies? Quite simply, it's because people don't really like apple. Apple is a generic pie flavor. It's the vanilla ice cream of the pie world. If you're going to buy ice cream for a party, you're not going to buy the gelato stracciatella with the Nutella topping and the cayenne pepper. You're going to buy vanilla. Maybe you buy chocolate. You're probably buying vanilla. Apple pie is the same way. If you're getting a great big 30 centimeter type pie, you're buying it because you're going to share it with a lot of other people. If you're getting a tiny little 10, 11 centimeter pie, you're getting that because you plan on eating the entire thing yourself and you're gonna get the flavor that you like. So what Big Data lets us answer is a question we never thought to ask. Is apple actually everyone's favorite flavor of pie? Now we know it's not. It's the one that people buy because nobody particularly dislikes it, but there are a whole lot of flavors that America likes better than apple pie. Now while that's just one example of what you can do with Big Data, think big picture you can now answer questions that previously you might be able to ask, but the data wasn't out there. But now through large amounts of data, through social media, through the internet of things, we can now collect and analyze all that information. So if you can think of it, the answer's out there.